The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome once again to NDE Radio with me, Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening by podcast, on TalkZone, or through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel. Today's show is part two of last week's interview with Darren and Jennifer Hamm. On last week's show, wife Jennifer described how angry and selfish husband Darren had been before his life-changing shared death experience when their beloved two-year-old Griffin passed away in Darren's arms. If you haven't yet heard that amazing story, be sure to look it up on our YouTube channel. Darren's vision of heaven and what he learned about God's love converted him to a life of love and relationship, and service to others, especially in the difficult matter of preventing suicides. The issue of judgment and punishment for sin is a touchy one among NDEers generally. That's because most of them experience God's love without reservation. A topic more rarely covered on shows like this, however, is the question of separation from God's love after death, and whether such a hell could even be possible. But in fact, there are NDEers who have visited places of torment. Dubbed distressing NDEs by researchers, these are stories brought back from the other side of a separation from the love of others, and especially from the love of God. Most NDEers are what are called universalists, those who believe the love of God is so universal that no one could possibly be condemned to suffering after death. After all, what behavior on earth could be so bad that God would want to have nothing to do with them when they died. Still, there are visions of hell seen by perhaps as many as one in 10 of near-death experiences. The reason it's so hard to get an accurate count is that so few DNDEers, distressing NDEers, are willing to talk about horrors they encountered on the other side. Still, NDEs should not come as a surprise. One of the first NDE stories in history was Plato's report of a soldier named Ur who comes back to tell his account of what happens when we die. The first place his soul came to was a place of judgment, with temporary rewards or punishments coming to the newly arrived. However, the soldier reported that some souls were so damaged, they were condemned to eternal separation from God's love. It's easy to relate this first judgment to what NDEers call the life review, where the soul experiences the pain they caused others during their life as as if they were the other person. It's easy to imagine a soul like Hitler's or Putin's being so ashamed of the pain they caused that they would judge themselves as being forever unworthy of God's love and condemn themselves to eternal separation from the source of love. And bear in mind that when we say eternal, we are merely describing a reality outside of time where eternal simply means now, now, now. Our return guest today, Darren Hamm, a confirmed atheist till then, did not see any sign of hell during his SDE 11 years ago when he shared in the death of his two-year-old, an amazing boy named Griffin. Darren discovered when he returned, that he had been gifted with the ability to detect, encounter, and heal people so troubled they were considering suicide as their only option. Using his gift from God, Darren has stopped more than 100 potential suicides from killing themselves. Darren has tried recruiting others to join him in this effort, but so far has failed to find folks with a conviction that God wants this to happen, that suicide is a terrible mistake with perhaps eternal ramifications for the soul's that die by their free will choice and by their own hand. Now, let me note that suicide is not necessarily an unforgivable sin, as the Catholic Church used to proclaim. No, the unforgivable sin, according to the Bible, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, God's spirit of love that flows to those who open their hearts to receive it. Cutting yourself off from that love is a free will choice, and those prone to suicide can fall into such a state of despair that it becomes impossible for them to forgive themselves. This makes Darren's calling especially important and his need for help critical. And my thought is that perhaps he has been recruiting in the wrong place. 
that he should be reaching out to the many NDEers who have actually experienced God's love during their visit to the other side. Some Christian churches still debate whether we are saved by faith or by works. But most NDEers have the understanding that it's all about love. St. Paul, who had a near-death experience himself, knew the primacy of love when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13. And many NDEers, I suspect, possess the conviction and knowledge about love necessary to help Darren open the eyes of those contemplating suicide. So, Darren Ham, welcome back to NDE Radio. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure, Lee. Darren, when, when Griffin was so sick, a psychologist friend of your family's um, had uh, a vision of seven angels standing around Griffin's bed. Yeah. But, she, and she, but she was in a place where she was about to leave the practice of, of psychiatry because, um, because of the high number of suicides that she was encountering. Um, and I wonder if that, uh, that vision that she had was a, a, um, a prompting to her to talk to you about the kind of, um, of healing that you're doing with folks who are thinking of killing themselves. So it's, it's interesting. Um, those two events are 10 years apart. Hmm. When she had her vision, she was, I think, rather just slight acquaintance uh, with my wife and called in the middle of what we were experiencing with Griffin and saw the seven angels in Jen and, and me and Griffin and asked if everything was okay, uh, verifying her vision. And we said, no, things aren't okay. After that, a relationship had formed. Uh, and uh, she quickly left the area. And we haven't really heard from her in a, in a decade. Uh, so just uh, a month ago, when she wrote the article for the Epic Times, at the very end, she, she was kind and said how much it had affected her hearing that testimony a decade ago. And she thought it was time uh, for it to get out because I really don't tell it. And at the end of the interview is when she said, you know, I'm preparing to leave my practice because there is such an overwhelming suicide issue, even with youth uh, under 12 years old now that, uh, and they have not been able to help people. And I said, it's interesting. Um, that's, that I've been shown how to, how to help. So I explained it and it made sense to her. So wow. I don't, I don't know what she's going to do with it uh, because it's, 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 it's uncomfortable. And I don't know in a, in a big medical dish, she's a very, very important. Uh, I don't know how well it would go over um, mm -hmm. doing something, the sort of what I do. It, it, really not mainstream. Darren, how did you discover that you have this ability to find and help heal those thinking about killing themselves? You know, it was shortly after I was back and I, I was home. Uh, it's just studying. I wanted to know everything about God. Uh, and I was just studying uh, every day, all day long, as, as much as I could take. I was, I was absorbing uh, reading, reading scripture, Old and New Testament. And and when I had gone and gotten that Bible, I saw a, it was an NDE, I, I suppose, um, that a gentleman had of hell. And the title was 23 Minutes in Hell, and his name was Bill Weiss. And I had the audio version of the book. I think it was CDs, actually, at the time. And one of the suicide people actually kept my CDs and didn't give it back. So oh, no. I no longer have it, but <laughs> I, uh, since I've downloaded, you know, into my phone, um, but I, I had listened to it and it was so, I knew he had it. I, I knew it was real because there were so many similarities that were really undescribable that were the same as heaven, but completely the opposite. Mm. So I had to imagine for my experience that there is another place uh, for people who don't want to be with God, uh, that they can separate themselves from his love. So I got really supernaturally, I think it was one of the first times it ever happened. 
uh, how to break the deception of suicide. So uh, it wasn't long and it started. Uh, it's funny, once you're equipped uh, to handle something, uh, it's funny how it crosses your path constantly. Yes. Yes, constantly. Mm -hmm. I can't say it's a great thing, uh, it's, but if you love deeply, I, I think it is. I think it is a great thing. In a way, it is akin to exorcism, isn't it? I mean, there's a there's something that's driving someone in a yes, self-destructive direction. Yes, it is. And I, I can uh, give some scenarios that really exemplify that, um, really very pronounced. Um, and, and it's more of the more recent ones since I've gotten better and better at it um, that that has appeared, that has appeared. Oh. I would call it a deliverance myself. Uh, so I don't know how to do an exorcism. Um, I would just call it a deliverance. It's just, uh, in fact, I could tell a story. Uh, it's a quick story. Please. I was talking to a Catholic priest, a, a very wise, very wise man. And he, he was asking me about gift gifts. And I told him about suicide deliverance. Uh, it's so strange to have that as a gift. And he asked me how, how I do it. And I said, I just break the deception ring. And that's, that's it. That's all I do. And he said, that's exactly right. And we just moved on. Yeah. It was a very quick conversation. So what, what is that deception barrier? That deception is I, I've experienced. Uh, would you like me to tell a story, Lee? Yes, please. So I, I had a call. It, these always happen really strange, really peculiar ways uh, that I, you can just feel the love of God in it, that he will drive somebody intersecting your life. I had a phone call from um, North Carolina. I'm in Pennsylvania. And it was after my bedtime, I go to bed early and I answered the phone and it was a girl that was hysterical. And she said, God told me to call you. I said, okay. okay. And she said, I'm just heading out to a shed uh, to, to, hang, to hang myself. And, and he told me to ask you if I'm going to hell. And I said, well, if you're consciously doing that, you most likely are. Uh, would you not do that tonight? So I'll pray for you and we'll, we'll pray uh, for a deep sleep and I will come get you in the morning. And in the morning, we'll get free of this desire. So I uh, prayed and she went right to sleep. Uh, and I picked her up in the morning. And I had uh, taken her to a church. I was trying to get some people there to uh, be able to do this, uh, but there was really no interest. Uh, so I ended up having to do it myself. So, so outside of the church, it was a rare moment where God spoke to me. Uh, it doesn't happen frequently. It, it's normally more scripture based my, for my experience. Um, it's not, a lot of off the wall things. So he had spoke to me. Uh, she was, uh, she had gotten herself involved in a, in a dark, very, very dark world, um, sexually speaking. And, and I said, uh, a demon is trying to convince you to, to do that, isn't he? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, I believe God spoke his name to me. Uh, does the name Slender Man mean anything? And she just couldn't believe it. In fact, she almost immediately became a Christian. Uh, she said, how would you know that? How would you know that? And I said, I just felt God told me that. And she said, I was having an affair on my husband with a man that had a uh, tattoo on his left arm. <laughs> and it was a drawing. And underneath it, it said Slender Man. And I said, yes, it was a Native American demon, uh, actually. And um, that's probably where you're, why you're so plagued with this desire. Uh, and he's trying to deceive you into joining him. So 
that, that's just one example. And there's hundreds. I thought about it, Lee. There's, there's got to be well over 100. I think last week there was three. Um, just wow. last week. What uh, so then? What happens when she recognizes that um, that there's something outside of her compelling her to this uh, state of mind? Where does that where does that leave her? Is she then able to cope? Oh, uh, to, that there is a spirit world. It's just it's just not this world. Um, that there's more to it uh, in eternity. Um, she she. Um, Actually, uh, in that case, uh, she did struggle. Uh, she did struggle. And it was, uh, she no longer was going to kill herself, which was all I ha- am skilled at. So I actually did have to take her uh, to a um, gentleman. He was a, 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 uh, the dean of a uh, seminary, of a uh, Pentecostal seminary. And uh, he specializes in deliverances. So I, I had to take her for help. That was beyond what I could do. Mm-hmm. And, um, I per, he, I, he asked me to help him, and I kind of co-piloted her. Uh, honestly, that you would probably call that more of an exorcism. Um, I witnessed that, and things kind of went sideways in the middle. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, there's sometimes there's more help that's needed. However, mm-hmm. uh, nearly 100 percent of the time. Um, I, I uh, just heard of a gentleman that needed extra help and I didn't receive that extra help. And it took him a few years. A uh, sort of all these cases, uh, well over a hundred. Uh, there was one, one uh, that followed through with it, but uh, it was under pretenses that is uh, that someone was going to help him and to get him that extra help. And he did, he did not. You did not receive any more help. Well, if you've only lost one out of all that more than a hundred, you're batting a whole lot better than a lot of uh, psychologists and psychiatrists are. And, yes, yes. And, and I would say clergy as well, for that matter, because yes. as a chaplain, as a hospital chaplain, I I met several people who had tried to kill themselves and failed, and that's why they were in the hospital and uh, did what I could for them. But uh, Tell us another story that's um, a, a little less demonic in its context. Okay, I, I can give all, every kind of story I have. I can't remember a lot of them because it's really you're entering a you're entering in utter darkness. It, it, it is just so present. Uh, you are entering utter darkness. So I try to block out a lot, but I can give I can give a lot of them. Every time I tell one, I probably can remember another one. <laughs> um, I, I had, I was in church and, and it wasn't, this wasn't as off the wall. This is more of a normal story. I, I was in church and, uh, in the, in this case, I, I heard God speak to me uh, that this young man uh, was going to kill himself. And I, uh, went over to the parents and the parent is kind of in that field a little bit. He's a health teacher. So I approached them at church and I said, Hey, I, you know, I'd like to talk to you. Is everything okay? You know, um, is your son doing okay? And they said, actually, not, actually not doing okay. That's why we're in church. And I said, well, if you would like some help, I know what he's struggling with and I, I could help him. So they called me a few days have passed and they called me uh, one night to come over right away. Uh, so I, I rushed right over to their house. A lot of these happen at night, uh, mostly always at night. I rushed right over to their house, and it was one of the only times <laughs> that I let the parents kind of participate in it uh, because I was dealing with the youth. I uh, I thought, ah, we'll see how it goes. I normally like to have the person alone, uh, just so other people aren't pulling their attention and they can be more authentic, uh, and there, there's not any acting then going on or deceptions. I just really like to cut to the chase. So in this case, I let the parents sit in the room uh, since one was kind of a professional. So I talked to him and I said, Hey, I, um, 
talked to your pastor before I came and told him I was coming. And I told him what I think where you got this from. And uh, he told me I was wrong, uh, that there was absolutely no way. There was no way. And, but I think the pastor was wrong. Um, and I feel that you have got this strong desire uh, to, to kill yourself uh, from music. Are you listening to some kind of music that's that's elevating suicide? And the mom just lost it. And she said, that's it. That's it. And it kind of validated me, you know, that <laughs> uh, she was so theatrical. She stood up and very reserved woman. And she said, you know, I picked him up the other day and there was three songs I heard him listen to just on the ride home that were talking about suicide. So in this case, not as demonic, uh, more mainstream, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, he had, had gotten that desire, and we went, we went through things, and I had never heard from him again. Uh, but I um, did see him on TV as doing something uh, very special last year, uh, that he was on the local news. Yeah. Uh, so that was pretty neat. And yeah. wow, the father that's... told the pastor, hey, uh, Man, I don't know about all this. He goes, I'm ashamed because I do this for a living. And I couldn't help my own son. Uh, and that man, he he has a gift. He's really on to something. Um, I just cannot even believe it. So there's a kind of a mainstream example. Yeah. Have you had to work uh, with any um, veterans, uh, people with PTSD? You know, I had the opportunity, uh, but uh, there again, uh, they uh, never followed through. And he, he, uh, they reached out um, and kept delaying meeting. I said, I'll come right now. I will come right now. And uh, they just kept delaying. And uh, he, he actually did it. Uh, and his son then did it as well. When you talk to someone uh, initially, do they think that if they kill themselves, that everything will be dark and quiet and that will be the end of everything? There, there's two camps. Uh, one is much harder than the other camp. Uh, one is, one is it, uh, it frequently, it's very hard for things to go well in one camp. But in that camp you're discussing, oh, those are very easy. They're very quick. Um, maybe 40 minutes, uh, maybe an hour. Um, and most of the time, uh, that's what you encounter is whatever it is. Uh, a lot of times it's consequences. Uh, a lot of times it's kind of more supernatural, but uh, they believe that their pain or consequences will just stop. It will just end and they will just no longer exist. Uh, that's been the majority of what I have dealt with are people that, uh, I don't know that you would know more Lee than me um, the the term for that. Uh, they just believe they stop existing. Well, it's it's a, I think a common belief among atheists that you know we are only alive in the body, and once the body dies, the soul is there is no soul, and that that's the end. I'm familiar with that, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you? Uh, have you had to deal as a former atheist yourself? Have you had to deal with atheists who uh, who uh, would argue with you that uh, there is no afterlife? No, never. Really? Never, never, never. Wow. They never argue. I could tell you uh, more stories. Would you like to hear another one? Yes, please. So uh, we had met a couple, uh, actually a babysitter of my son, Griffin. And I desperately did not want to see them. And my wife brought them to our house. And and uh, husband was a kind of a rough guy, a uh, pipeliner. And and I was just so overflowing at the time where I, I really struggled to not mention the love of God and the beauty of Jesus. And, and I would. Uh, and they were very receptive. And uh, they kept wanting to come to my house, uh, which was unique. And... Uh, for people that weren't believers and uh, they would learn more and more. So I asked my wife, I felt I, we should stop by their house unannounced, uh, which is a road. No, no, I don't really care for that either. 
But right when we had got there, uh, they said, oh, boy, I can't believe you guys stopped by uh, right now. There's these people that are, uh, they're out looking for their son. We were just about to go help. Uh, they had found a suicide note. Uh, she said, but my husband had uh, beat up this woman's husband in the front yard two years ago, and they haven't come back. And uh, just then, I said, wow, well, let's just pray. Let's just pray, you know, that this boy is found because uh, they found the suicide note. And he had gone off into the woods. So just then, it was minutes, just minutes. And here, here the woman was uh, knocking on the door, uh, the, the mother of this boy. And she said, hey, guys, I just, I need help. I don't know what to do. And we said, what happened? You know, have, have you found him? She said, yeah, he's out in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, took the uh the uh, gentleman that had been stopping at my house and we went into the car and and it it's always the same conversation and these are the they're more pleasant ones honestly i just so uh, we talked and i i loved him uh that's very important i don't think that you can really do successful things without loving someone and listening to them and hearing their pleas and and um, I listened to him and I just asked him a question because, you know, fortunately they found you. Um, and I asked him, what, so what happens, you know, once you're successful doing this? Uh, what, what, what then happens? And he said, nothing happens. I just will no longer be and I'll be out of this torment. Uh, this pain uh, will be gone. Not physical pain, more of a mental pain. And then I say, um, I, your soul, I explain the soul and how I've been to heaven and I used to feel the same way, but I physically have, I've been to heaven and I can tell you, I promise your soul will continue on. So I said, would you like to give a preview and knowing this, that you have a responsibility, um, would you like a preview of what it's going to be like for you. And uh, at, and th at that point, I, I it sounds crazy, but I, I've i just used that Bill Weiss. Uh, his account of what he was shown was, was uh, I, I believe him. I, I just, I truly believe him that he was shown that with a message uh, that everyone thinks that it doesn't exist. Uh, that was why God showed it to him. So I said, uh, let me preview. So I kind of skipped to just where, you know, he starts falling. And, uh, and it's normally uh, there a half an hour, maybe 20 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes. You find different ones on YouTube and, and around. And um, at some point they say, okay, I've had enough. I'm not going to kill myself. So it kind of gives them a different perspective that, um, that their soul will go on and maybe things aren't as bad as they could be uh, when they hear uh, what that afterlife that is one that is outside of the love of God, what that is like to have the absence of God, an absence of love, uh, what that is like. And um, that's all, that's, that's all there is to it. Although uh, that's not all there is to it. Um, Sometimes the people need follow up uh, with someone else. Um, I just do the deliverance, really. Uh, sometimes in some unique cases, I've agreed to counsel afterwards, and that's going well. But there are other cases. Uh, that's just one case. Oh, tell uh, us. Some, tell us another one. That, so that's the main group. Uh, but there are another camp of 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 Christians that tend to be the most difficult ones. Not uh, not all questions I can give. It's probably easiest if I just continue to give examples. Is that sure. okay? Sure, of course. So, because I, I don't know a lot other than what I've experienced. So I had a uh, dream one night and my wife had woke up in the morning and said, wow, this person we had met one time um, 
boy, she, it's really dire a uh, post she just made. And I said, oh, that's, that's, that's her. I, I just had a dream about her. I, I didn't know who it was when I, when I was dreaming it, but now I know uh, that knowledge that th that was uh, the person I dreamt about. Uh, please get her to the house. It's an emergency. And my wife had tried, but this girl wouldn't respond. And she kept trying and she agreed to come to the house. And I said, well, she's, she's having an affair uh, with her best friend's husband, which is also her boss. And uh, um, when she tells you that she's tried to kill herself and she's going to try again, uh, please come get me. So it had been hours, three hours of talking. They were talking and I did a study with my daughter upstairs. And I fell asleep. And then my wife came upstairs and said, hey, you're not going to believe it. Uh, she was having an affair. And she just said she just tried killing herself. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, okay, let me talk to her. Um, so I went down and here, this girl had a terrible, terrible, terrible childhood. And she had court ordered counseling. Um, she told me, you know, thousands of hours and she knew all about it and didn't, didn't need any help. And I said, okay, just, can you give me 15 minutes? And I did the deliverance. I explained mostly that, you know, this soul is eternal, but she knew that she was a Christian, a very popular church and with their type of teaching uh, that is very attractive to people's ears. And, and uh, one, I've argued, wanted to argue, yes, I know the soul goes forever, but when I kill myself, I'm going, I'm going just, to, I'm going to be with her. A God in heaven. And I said, well, maybe there's a chance that, you, that, uh, that you're not right. And I said, let me show you the other side quick. And I had to do a very quick five minute version. And um, even afterwards, she argued that no, no, that's not how it works. Every, people that kill themselves go to heaven. I said, well, okay. Um, but, but I believe you're wrong. But it's your decision. It's your decision. So uh, she left, and uh, all these beautiful things happened. And she is claiming an absolute deliverance in 15 minutes. And um, oh. yeah, in 15 minutes. And uh, she had been taught so incorrectly her whole life a version of Christianity that's just inaccurate. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's another example. But those are the, that's the harder ones, honestly. Those are the harder ones. How do you feel like you're going to, God is going to just rain down blessings on you for doing that? Um, I don't know. Uh, there's a sense I had that experience with her. It was my first one that really put up a fight that, you know, uh, I researched, started like, wow, how do I help uh, the Christians uh, that are suicidal? And I had done some research and a uh, real popular show on TV. Um, I think I can remember her name even. Uh, her name was Tamara. Tamara. Uh, she had done it uh, with a uh, gun in her stomach. Hmm. She ended up pulling the trigger in her stomach. Uh, but originally it was going to be the chest, I think, the heart. And um, she experienced hell uh, because she did pull the trigger. But in the last moment, um. God said, don't do it in the heart or face, wherever she was going to do it, and decided in the stomach instead. And the love of Christ was so profound uh, that he came and got her out of hell and brought her back to life. Uh, so I listened to that, and I was like, wow, maybe that one would help. So I shared that with some people. You know, here's a Christian that did it. Um, and um, Christ said, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> please don't do that no there's a couple examples there those there, are the harder ones yeah well there are even NDEers who say um because they've experienced the love of god that god would never do anything like that because god loves us so much but the problem is and it may be it may be that the buddhists have the answer for this when they talk about the bardo and monsters and the hellish situations in the bardo 
they say it all comes from our own brain or well i guess i should say from our own mind that we are self-inflicting hell on ourselves and if we feel after we die and after we experience um an objective evaluation of our lives that we're just not worthy of god's love we could be doing this all to ourselves i i, I watched bill weiss's um 23 minutes in hell and he's, ah! <laughs> he's describing a very uh traditional uh dante like hell yes and and you think as you're listening why would god create a place like that well he said it's because demons needed to go to hell but I suspect that perhaps we make our own hell when we cut ourselves off from God's love. In either case, it's hell. No doubt about it. Yes, and that's exactly what's going on, Lee. You're exactly right. We are cutting ourselves off. It's not God sending anyone. I agree. He wouldn't send anyone. Uh, His love I experienced. And even when I was there, I haven't described it uh, because it was a real mystery to me. I thought, how could anyone not be saved when I was in heaven? How could anyone not be saved? Uh, I I had that thought. And um, yes, but it's a fact, exactly what you said. It's not God sending anyone. It's it's not. How about we try a little role playing? Okay. I'm going to kill myself. I'm coming (sighs) to you. (laughs) And it's, it's been, it's life's been hell. You know, I was, and I'm going to make all of this up for the benefit of the story that I'm addicted to heavy drugs that I can't get off it, that I see I'm ruining my family's life on account of it, that, uh, that I've thought about suicide and I don't believe that uh, God cares for me one way or the other, that I'll probably just be left alone after I die. Yes. And I'm, I'm just coming to you to tell you this because uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is the, a last plea for help. Yeah, so I totally understand there are awful, awful situations. And it's it's awful to hurt people. And I'm sure um I'm sure it's 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 killing you on the inside, watching the damage you're doing. But the suicide is serious. Uh, to 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 no longer have any options is what you're saying, um, that's final. You just want the finality of your life, right? Yes. So, unfortunately for you, your life will continue. You will just be killing the flesh, but you're making a permanent decision for a temporary problem that people that love you can help you. Would you like to at least um, have a tour of where you would possibly likely be going? Would you like to look at another option on if there's 1% chance that I am right on what you could be experiencing and it possibly would be worse than what you're currently experiencing. Okay. So then I just cut to, um, I use Bill Weiss, but maybe there's other people that uh, have, you would know, uh, Lee, that uh, there may be other people that have more concise or more accurate, uh, but Bill is, yes, it's very Dante-like, uh, and I use that, and I just uh, look at the person and love them, and I don't speak. Uh, it's very important, uh, that part. I don't speak. Uh, mm-hmm. If a person wants to speak, I just pause it and let them speak, and I'll answer whatever questions they have. And when they're ready, I just go back into it and, um, and, you know, until we complete it, or I can just kind of sense in my spirit uh, that it's complete. And then I just love them and leave and, you know, I'll advise uh, someone to help uh, them with or supervise them or, or, uh, or things like that. And I, I, I roll on in however capacity that is. It just occurred to me that um, there's uh, the people that are so depressed that they are contemplating suicide are aware of the existence of evil, perhaps like no other people. 
Yes. That may be why it's so easy to convince them of a, a totally different theology than they were raised with or never thought of or uh, had denied a long time ago. Maybe they can they can envision hell as uh, as Bill Weiss is describing it because they've been living it yes. <laughs> already. And and yes. uh, what you're doing is just saying, no, it's not going to end when you when your body dies, man. Yes. It's not going to end. It's going to go no, you on will continue. just just like just what's putting you in in a state of mind that wants to kill itself. <laughs> you are going to be continuing it for eternity. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so when I was in heaven, my sense of feeling I was magnified a thousand fold. And I would have to believe uh, other eternities that uh, people that are the opposite uh, would also have feeling magnified and to have that darkness um, grayness that be magnified. um, I would only have to assume it's similar. Mm -hmm. Uh, That would be wretched. That would be making a problem a thousand times worse. Have you ever run into someone who believes in reincarnation and thinks they're just going on to another life? I've not had one of those. I have not, and I I don't really even get into, I'm more of uh, just a worker in the field, honestly. Um, I don't even get into big theological debates. I just really do what I do. Um, I think that would weigh down. um, I'm not ever trying to win an argument, really, uh, with any of these. I just, I'm just a worker. And after so many, you kind of get to be a bit of a pro. Um, so I'm just uh, concise and accurate, and I just do what I do. If people call you up or get in touch with you, it would be by email, and say, I've had an NDE. I know what the love of God is all about. Yeah. I've been there. I've seen it, done it. I can convince people that there is life after the body dies. Can I help you working with potential suicides? How would you use them? So I would uh, just equip them with our discussion. Once they're equipped, it wouldn't be me that would be using them. It would be God using them, not Mm me. Once I receive this message from God, I mean, I had just picked up a Bible and that I was just drawn to the uh, vision uh, that Bill had had. And uh, it just started happening. But some of the stories I told you, you see how it happens. Um, It is just really supernatural. It's not physical. It's not a planning that goes on. Uh, Once a person has those tools, God will use those tools uh, because his love is just so deep that he wouldn't want any of us to depart from him. So they will just be used. Uh, So my help would just be, hey, you know, uh, uh, helping to equip, really. But God would do everything, really. It's just it needs some people with a little bit of courage and a, a deep love for a person's soul. That's 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 it. Yeah. Wow. Well, I think the only thing that would <clears throat> possibly keep someone from trying to do what you're doing is the fact that you have a, a sensitivity. You have a um, almost a psychic ability to spot people in need. But if, if this got established, you wouldn't have to find them because they, they would find you yes. or, or whoever is doing the work, doing the work that you're doing now. In other words, if there are hotlines for suicide, uh, what a great place for someone to volunteer if they had this uh, information. If they were working in that, they probably wouldn't be allowed to say what I say. <laughs> well, then they would have to say, I can help you, but I can't help you on yeah. this phone call. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there might, there might be other ways they could get around it. But see, that if that's the thing that works, if the picture of the reality of, of uh, life after death is what works, then it shouldn't be denied because of political correctness or. Uh, it is, it, it is, Leah. And it's so hard because I think, honestly, all of us, uh, the one that uh, did do that was uh, related to me. Uh, the only one that I've um, 
that that followed through. I was related, and every family has someone related um, to them that did this, and and it's just not a pleasant thing to encounter. But instead of being politically correct, uh, I would rather love uh, to see this stop rather than uh, because I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or give them an unpleasant thought uh, that we'll just let this continue uh, because it seems to happen in, in, in clusters. Uh, once somebody in the family does it, it seems to attach them and grow to, to other family members or friends. Well, Jesus experienced that uh, when you're own, in your own hometown or maybe dealing with your own family, it's, uh, you know, prophecy, your, your abilities are sadly diminished because they remember you when. In other words, he couldn't do healings in his own town like he could other places because, because people would say, oh, that's just Jesus. Yeah, very true. And, and maybe that's what happened in, in dealing with someone that you knew or were, yes. were, were related to. I mentioned the other day when we were talking off the air that uh, it's been reported that people who have tried to commit suicide by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge, if they happen to survive, hit the water the right way, they all unanimously say, as I was falling, I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. And, uh, and so I think that's probably, as someone is dying, they uh, can regret and even ask for forgiveness for suicide. So there are some exceptions to, uh, to, uh, Oh, absolutely. And, and there's mental illness, Lee, that there are scenarios. Um, I was counseled by a very, very knowledgeable man that like you, uh, was a chaplain for a long time. He was a, a Dean, uh, for a long time and, and he had given his life to the poor and, uh, just a miraculous man. I unfortunately lost him a couple months ago and everyone's like, oh, are you okay? Because, he was 82, but him, he, he and I were so close. Uh, we would spend every other day together, really. And um, he had all these doctorates in deliverance work. So that's what, that's what he did. And he, he counseled me one day. And he said, Darren, you can't throw such a blank statement out there because you're wrong. And I said, well, I could be wrong. I just know what I do. And I know the fruit of it. I'm not a theologian. I just do what I was instructed to do. I, I'm a, I follow orders well, I suppose. And he said, well, Darren, you know, I worked in a mental hospital uh, for a long time. And let me tell you, others oh, mental illness that they don't even know they're doing that. And I said, oh, you're probably right. You know, I'm, I'm not really an arguer. So not anymore anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. Yeah. So there are, hey, and look, none of us are the judge. I'm not the judge. I don't want to be the judge. I don't even want to know, really, uh, that I will just give that uh, to God because uh, he's never asked uh, my help uh, judging people. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, probably all wind up judging ourselves anyway. When we're in the objective light of God, we can't, we can't lie to ourselves anymore. No. Well, Darren, we're just about out of time for today, but tell folks how they can get in touch with you um, by email. Even if they're thinking about suicide themselves, they, they'd they be welcome, wouldn't they? And, oh, absolutely. absolutely. And, and for anyone that's had a near-death experience or similar uh, uh, spiritually transformative experience and think they could do what you're doing or help with, uh, help with what you're doing. That's what's uh, needed. Yeah. Okay, so give them your email address. Led by the sun, S O N, at yahoo.com. Led by the sun at yahoo.com. Very yes. good. Well, blessings on you and on your work and on your family, your lovely Thank wife. Thank you, Lee, and yours. I am so grateful that you came on and that we had this discussion. We've not done anything like, quite like this before on in eight years of doing this show. So I am very humbled and appreciative of what you're doing and, and, and that you could come here and talk about it. Well, Hey, hopefully somebody has helped. Yes, absolutely. 
If listeners would like to hear this show again, or the first part of the Ham's family uh, experience with their wonderful son, Griffin, go to uh, our more than 400 archived ad-free NDE interviews on Talk Zone or on the YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. But especially look up Darren's first part, the first part of this two-part series, because it will give you a real insight into how much a visit to the other side can change a person. Anyway, on our YouTube channel, you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE Radio library. Be sure to like, follow, and share our NDE Radio Facebook page. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, at Talk Zone, for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying... Thanks for listening.